Okay, Chris Peaks here with Micah Messer today. He ran for the uh, State House of Representatives back uh, in 2022. Um, you know, I was uh, really disappointed because, uh, um, man, I, I thought you had a lot of momentum in that race. Um, I was really expecting you to win. Uh, wh what do you think happened? Well, I think there's several things that came into play. Obviously, I think that I did have a lot of momentum. I went from basically less than 1% in recognition, recognition to at to least 42.7, which was what the, the, the final, final vote was, was, right? Well, give or take one or two percentage points for people who are just checking a mark or something. So I think I did have a lot of momentum going in. And, and I did, I did a lot of work, work and I think and it was, think it was quite, successful quite successful in that regard. However, However like, you like you mentioned, I didn't, I didn't, win, didn't it. win it. So, so I, think I think ultimately it came, I think ultimately came to the fact of I was outspent was about, about five to five one. To one. Um, um, and on top of that, that my right name recognition, recognition was, was nothing when I started. When I started. So, so overcoming, overcoming that's a big deal. Overcoming the combat in general is a big deal. And, and she got, she several, got several endorsements, endorsements from, from high profile high Republicans, Republicans, including, including current, current um, um, at the, at the time, as the Speaker of the House, House if I recall, recall, and I believe yeah, Lieutenant, Lieutenant Governor, Governor as well. As well. So, so overcoming, overcoming that's kind that of difficult, that's kinda difficult especially, especially when most when people, people look, at look at the headlines, the headlines they're seeing things from Al.com, uh, which, which we all know is not the most reliable news source. And they just kind of go off that and. You know, that's what they saw. They got a lot of mailers, a lot of texts uh, from my opponent, and uh, she ended up winning it. Um, she spent more money in the campaign. I think I ended up spending about 38000 and she raised and spent about 180 or so. So it's it's really hard to overcome that much of a gap. can be done. Obviously, even with that in place, I still got 42.7% of the vote. So, so I still, I still think, think that, that in a way, in a way it, was a, it win, was a win, but not but in the not win, win I wanted. I wanted. Yeah, because uh, I thought you had a really good uh, ground game too, uh, the way you were going out and being amongst the people. Um, I, I felt real real good for you in that race. And I was kind of surprised, you know, um, what you just said about money, you, you just it's almost impossible. Yeah, I mean, you can, but it's it's almost impossible. Like, I was advising Brent Woodall in the PSC race, and uh, we were outspent eight to one, and he got beat fifty-two percent to forty-eight percent. Right, right. And you know, you're thinking, man, if we could have just had you know fifty thousand more dollars, fifty thousand more dollars, um, you know, that could have been a totally different race. But uh, it seems to me that when you get in Alabama, and, I, and maybe this is like this in other states, when you become when you get that legislative seat or that PSC seat. And you're an incumbent the powers that be are going to dump everything they can to keep you in office it is, it is especially, especially if, if you're, controllable. you're controllable and, and what, what i mean by that is, is you do you what do the party, what the party asks, you asks you to do, do. you do you what do the caucus, caucus asks you to do you do what the you speaker do. asks you to do you do what the governor asks you to do if you fall in line then they're going to want to keep you there because they know that they can rely on you being in line while well, someone, someone like me, like kind of an, an outsider, outsider, and we saw this with a couple other, other individuals, individuals uh, some who are currently in the house, in the house um, are being the disruptors, as sometimes they're called, are doing a lot of good work. But the likelihood is they're going to have a middle of the road opposition come 2026, and the powers that be are going to dump a lot of money against them. So. It is very difficult to overcome that incumbency because of those individuals kind of being part of the party in Montgomery. And I mean, they, uh, I mean, they have hey, Chris, I think you're muted. Everything goes through, it seems like, just a few hands down there. Uh, and there's just a couple of people that's calling the shots. Well, in a way, yes. Uh, obviously, the, a lot of people have their hands in the cookie jar, so to speak. But ultimately, you know, the House Speaker 
or the uh, the Senate, um, I think it's the Senate president, they decide ultimately what bills come before the floor, right? They can they can basically say, nope, that bill's not going to come to the floor. And if that bill uh, through calendar stuff, now there's ways you can kind of get around that as representative. It's a lot of work and it's tough. Um, but in general, if they say, hey, this isn't going to be on the calendar, then your bill's dead. You're not going to get, nothing's going to happen with it. Um, they'll send it to a, uh, they assign committees, like where the bills go with committees and they can make a decision. Hey, your bill's going to go to, um, the education committee when really it should be going to the health committee. They'll make some reasoning for it. And because they know they can send it to this committee and it'll die in that committee. Um, and so there's a lot of that kind of politics going on in Montgomery killing bills and things like that. Um, so in a way it does go through a few, only a few individuals, but at the same time, there's a lot more at play than just that. Uh, so it's kind of a complex issue, uh, but I do think that there's definitely some problems there. And uh, we've seen that with some of the news stories recently, um, that there's some individuals in state government that shouldn't be in state government, Perfect example is the Alabama Department of Transportation chair. I mean, uh, you know, uh, not chair, but um, director. You know, what he's doing, I mean, he actually went to jail for something unrelated to his job, but what he's doing with the whole bridge fiasco and and, and all that, it's, it's all just party, like, I'm going to do what I want because I'm in power. And uh, that's unfortunately what we see in the whole United States abroad uh, there's a lot of corruption, but Alabama specifically, we have it here too. You know, we just passed the major, the largest um, budget in history, and mm -hmm. um, I'm looking at they were they tried. There was going to be an attempt to raise taxes on every phone in the state, cell phone, yep. household. Yep. Uh, they were going to put a dollar a month uh, tax on every water meter. I mean, there's two two million homes, and that's not even counting businesses. I mean, it, that, that's yeah. that's really even good. though, even though we already had a budget surplus. Yeah. On top yeah. of that, so not not even talking about like whether it was needed or not. We already had a budget surplus. We already had money left over. We got in more taxes than we anticipated, than was scheduled, and so we had extra money in the the pot to choose from. Yet. Like you just said, I I, I I know about the water meter, but I didn't know about the phone tax of uh, that being voted on. And yeah, it was going to be a tax on everybody's phone. Like we're not already taxed, first of all, uh, that's already in place. Why do we need more taxes when we had a surplus? Uh, it, it doesn't make any logical sense. It makes no logical sense at all. It, it would be like Florida, for example. Florida had a budget surplus as well. But what did Florida do? Did they raise taxes? No, they paid off their debt. What a brilliant idea. Alabama could have taken this surplus and paid off their debt. Instead, they're throwing it all over the place, doing who knows what with it. And, you know, the lieutenant governor, and and I'm, I'm all for this, you know, there should be no taxes on, on, on food. But, you know, he's pounding his chest that he's cut it from four cents to two cents. I mean, how long is that going to take somebody to even see that? Well, it, it would take a long time. Uh, first of all, you're talking, you know, I actually went grocery shopping today, uh, $124 later uh, for about a week's worth of groceries, uh, maybe a little bit more than a week, maybe about eight days or so, we usually go about eight days. Uh, but part of that, of course, was taxes. And we paid, you know, I think it was around just about 10 bucks or 12 bucks of taxes um, off that. And of course, you know, the state sales tax right now is, uh, I believe the state portion is 4% and they are going to lower the food to 2%. Now, Chris, I might blow your mind here, but I actually was against removing the tax on food. Really? Yes. And let me explain why, because I know that's a so counterintuitive. I'm a conservative, right? Why would I want to not remove taxes? I do want to remove taxes. The problem is the grocery tax is a form of sales tax aka a consumption tax is voluntarily entered into when you go and buy groceries unlike the income tax which you're forced to do at the at, at a gunpoint 
unlike your property tax, which you're forced to do at gunpoint, unlike all these other taxes, whether with your car, your whatever, all these other taxes you're forced to do at the point of a gun in order to live your life. When a sales tax, you voluntarily enter into that transaction, knowing it's going to be there. When me just living, me just working, I automatically have to pay the state taxes. So what I would rather have seen, and this is the, the Uniparty in Montgomery doesn't like to talk about this, but what we should have been doing for the last eight years, but especially this last year, we had the grand opportunity to get on the bandwagon like Mississippi and remove our state income tax. That's what we should have done. We had a surplus. Let's start phasing out the income tax. Instead, we focused on this, like you said, 2% on groceries, really? That's what you're gonna focus on? When that's, you're voluntarily entering into that. And for those who are low income, who need assistance, there's already programs for that. SNAP, EBT, whatever else you wanna talk about. There's, there are already programs for people who can't afford groceries. They just, raised, they just raised taxes 10 cents on gas in the last six years. Yeah. That alone, if they wouldn't have done that, guess what? The prices of groceries wouldn't be as high as they are because guess what happens when you raise taxes on gasoline? Everything gets to your store by truck. Every, when you increase the prices for gas and oil, everything goes up. So if they wouldn't have done that, start removing income tax, lo and behold, guess what? Everyone's groceries in the state of Alabama would be lower than they are now. And you'd have more money in your pocket to spend on groceries. I didn't know. I, I mean, I'm, that, that's, I, I never, I, I never would have thought of that. That, that is um, a great point. Um, you know, I think at first the governor wanted to give like a $500 tax rebate or something. Like I thought that. it was like 200 and something, but yeah, it was, okay. yeah, it was something, something under 500. I think you're correct. Okay. And, um, you know, and Ainsworth was bucking her. It seems like he tries to undermine the governor on every one of her decisions. So and he I'm sees the point. writing on the wall. So well, but, KIV, but. so KIV is not the most popular governor in the country. Well, uh, from what she did with COVID to ranked, other things. She's ranked number 10 as far as popularity goes, and she's 62% approval ratings. Is mm -hmm. that really the smartest thing to be doing going against a governor that has? I think he been? sees, I think he sees the writing on the wall. And so what I mean by that is he's putting himself in a position where he can say that he was tough on the governor for doing X, Y, and Z. And at the same time, he's not doing so much against her that it seems like he's just like flipped seats or flipped parties or something and became a Democrat and is just attacking the governor. Um, he's trying to put himself in a more being, he's trying to be more conservative than she is. That's what he's trying to do because he knows this is her last term. She's not going to be able to run again. This is it. And he's positioning himself so that he can run come was 2026. Yeah, and hopefully, I mean, right here, she's in really bad health. Uh, you know, God, hopefully she'll, you know. Nothing. It, if she is in really bad health, yeah, I don't want anything to happen to her. I think it would be best for her to resign um if she is in the position where she can't make decisions or something but i've also i, I personally know people who say they talk to her and she seems perfectly fine so i think there's a lot of rumors and we should be a little careful on what rumors we believe unlike yeah, joe biden you know which that. we all know he's a cripple so oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah i've listened to, listened to you know some of them. isn't he so far gone he doesn't even know he's in the world but yeah, I, I've listened to the governor, you know, on radio, sh you know, broad TV and stuff. And just for the moments that I see her, she seems fine. I mean, she right. seems coherent, you, you know, when she's speaking. Um, now I've heard rumors that she's had uh, colon cancer, throat cancer, lung cancer. Um, you know, again, I, uh, I want to. Isn't she? I, I could be wrong with this. Um, I want to say she is a cancer survivor. But that was well, years ago. Had, she supposedly had back in her first term, she had lung cancer and it went away and then throat cancer came back. Now, the rumor that I got last year from August through October, she went AWOL from the campaign trail and nobody knew where she was at. And I remember that she was having a she had colon cancer and she had a tumor removed. Okay. 
I, I haven't heard that rumor specifically, so I, I can't really give credence to it or or from it. But either way, like you said, in, in her public appearances, she seems to be perfectly fine and lucid in there. So does this seem like that w- with the um, and I know there's a lot of bills to get passed, but, you know, with the Republican trifecta, uh, the, the, the right bills are not getting passed. Oh, 100 percent. They're not. And that 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 kind of shows, and and it's kind of a new term that's kind of come up. It's called the Uniparty. I'm sure you've heard of it, um, which is the idea that really most Republicans out there are no different than Democrats. They just have different talking points, and Alabama is no different than that. If you think about it, Alabama wasn't a Republican state in the state house and state legislature until uh, I think it was 2014 was when they took over. From before that, it had been blue the whole time. It had been all Democrat. And to think, I mean, even the governor at one point was a Democrat. So to think that, you know, all of a sudden, all these people flipped to Republican are going to be these super conservatives. I mean, that's not very logical. There's going to be, and there's people who've been in position since 2014 that uh, they're that currently serving that, originally were Democrats and they switched over to the Republican party because they saw where the wind was blowing. They knew that they had to run as Republican in order to win. And that's what they're still doing, but they're not really conservative. Uh, and I've had talks with actual legislators who I'll be honest, uh, Republican in name only is a good word for it, I guess. Uh, they have some good social, they're socially conservative for, uh, for several things, but when it comes to, you know, fiscally, they're not at all. They're not fiscal conservatives at all. Um, they'll claim to be, but they're not. And I, I, what I did see this last legislative session, which was very disappointing, was the fact that, uh, you know, the anti-CRT bill didn't get passed. Where that's was twice, our, two twice, two years in a row. Um, that's with old legislators and all the new legislators, right? Um, it was basically killed by the leadership even though the Republican Party, no joke, the GOP party voted in their caucus, um, the actual party, not the legislators, the party voted as it one is it's not, I don't think it was number one, but it was in that like the top three, right, that it wanted this to pass. And the state legislator decided, you know what, the leadership, at least in the state legislature decided, we're just going to kill it. Um, and that just kind of shows they're not really in it for what the people want. They're in it for what they want. And this has been a problem here in Alabama for a very long time, a very, very long time. And it's not going to go away until the people wake up and stop electing the same people over and over again. Um, you know, the public service commission race was one I was um, heavily vested in. And, you know, I was listening to, um, you know, Twinkle Cavanaugh. And I, uh, well, she, well, I'm blasting her right now, but, you know, uh, Odin and um, um, Baker talking about fighting the uh, liberal environmentalist. And, you know, I tweeted to him, can, can you explain to me what a liberal environmentalist is? I mean, they just flock in every two years for the Public Service Commission. Can you, know, can you tell me what that is? Uh, do you have a definition for it? Um, you know, they throw these code words out there. Um, uh, uh, I'm fighting the liberal Biden Pelosi agenda, and that they have no control over that. And the voters continue to buy into this, and it's just so frustrating. Well, so when it comes to PSC, you know, there is limitations of what they can and cannot do. Um, but at the same time, in general, you're correct that a lot of the times candidates will claim. You know, I'm a good example would be a current senator. I won't mention a name, but a current senator who claimed that they were going to be anti Biden, anti woke, anti all this stuff, you know, fiscally conservative, gonna get a balanced budget, yada, yada, yada. They go into office, and what do you know? They're voting for the giant, the largest bill in the United States, you know? So, like, they claim X, Y, and Z, but ultimately, when they get into office, that's not really who they are. They're going to fall in line with the party and do what the party asks. And 
when it comes to specifically the PSC, you know, there obviously there are limitations what they can and cannot do. Um, and that's a, the whole, and I, I, this is kind of a little tangent, but I, I have a problem with the whole PSC concept um, with so much regulations on a private entity. But at the same time, I feel like we have to be careful with monopolies, right? So it's there's a there's there's a tug of war in my soul of like um, I don't want any regulations, but at the same time I don't want a monopoly, and so like there's this tug of war inside of my free market capitalistic soul of um, what do we do there? Uh, and I don't really have the answer, but you know, PSC is limited to what it can yeah, and cannot do, especially when it comes to what the federal government regulates. And I will say that in the last what Biden's been in office for, I guess, a little over three, three years now or something like that, um, or two years, sorry, two and a half years. You know, the, one of the first things he did when he got into office was shutting down the Keystone Pipeline, you know, yeah. and jobs in one day. that that was that was hard. And that was I mean, that was first off, it's not very <laughs> environmental to do that. They don't talk about how many trucks it takes to that, that oil's still moving. It's just moving by a truck and train, which is not any more environmental than a freaking pipeline. But anyway, um, you know, when they do stuff like that, it's going to affect our power. It's going to affect how much we're going to end up having to pay out of pocket. So like stuff like that, we, the Alabama doesn't have any control over no, no one at PSC. I don't care who you are, far left wing or far right wing or right down the middle or, or, you know, whatever you want to call yourself, you know, there are things that you cannot touch. You can't even do anything about. Um, but, and that what irritates me is when people campaign on things they cannot touch. Yeah. Like it really irritates pro me. Second amendment and pro -life. You, know, you have no control over the second amendment and, you know, pro life. And, right. You, know, you don't, and, it'd be like me. Yeah running for state representative like i did back in 2022 saying that i was i i was going to stop biden from getting into the office or i, or I was going to impeach biden that, that's a better one i'm going to impeach biden when i become elected as a representative what i can't do that i have no ability to do that now i'm all for it but like i can't do anything about it so making a claim for that is dumb now if someone asks me hey what's your opinion on impeaching biden Oh, oh, I think we should impeach him. You know, it's a, it's a simple answer. Like if I was running for, um, let's say I was running for PSC and someone asked me, Hey, are you pro-life? Yeah, I'm pro-life. I'm a, I'm an abolitionist for the unborn. You know, it, are you, are you pro second amendment? Yeah, I'm pro second amendment. I've got a lot of guns. I love guns. You know, I was military. I was police. I love guns, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I'm pro second amendment, but I wouldn't make it a, I wouldn't make it a campaign point. You know, but at the same time, and this is where it gets into politics. You got you ready for this? So, and I was taught this, and I learned about this. When you're running for office, if you don't include those statements, especially in a red state, if you're not, if you don't include your pro-life, pro-second amendment, you know, low taxes, yada yada, if you don't include that, people assume you're not, even though you have nothing to do with it at all. They're going to assume you're not, and therefore they will not vote for you. Because if you, as, for example, I put two different brochures by you, no pictures, no names, nothing. And one said pro second amendment, pro life, you know, pro America. Okay. And the other one said, um, I want to make sure Alabama power doesn't overcharge you. I want to make sure that we're not dumping sewage in uh, the lakes or whatever, you know, like which one are you going to vote for if you're just an everyday conservative? The everyday conservative is going to vote for the one with the second amendment. Well, yeah, exactly. And, and so when you're campaigning, you, that's part of it. And it, I wish the American people in general would be more discerning, right? On these things and on these issues to understand everything more, but I'll be honest and I get it. Those people are tired of politics. We've been beat over the head for the last 12 years with politics 24 seven. And I, I get it. I really do. But I really wish the everyday person would spend 
more time educating themselves on these types of things. How does the government run in Alabama? How does, what does the PSE even do? What does the state legislator do? What can they do? How much money do they actually play with? Where does my my tax dollars go? Do I really, are, is it really just giant general flush, slush fund? No, it's not. It's broken up to two. You have the education, then you have the general fund, and, and you can't take anything that's already stipend for the education. You gotta, you know, if, if I wish the everyday person. Chinese math problem. Or, or <laughs> finding it right I mean, it, it, I'm trying to figure out where that goes. Um, yeah, what, uh, uh, something you said a while ago about the, uh, you know, two brochures sitting beside each other. One of the candidates for the PSC, um, I won't name him, but he said, you know, it doesn't matter what you say you're going to do to try to help the people's lives in the state, make it better. All you got to do is say you're fighting the Pelosi, Biden, Obama agenda, and they're going to vote for you every time. And um, one thing I want to say I wouldn't, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say that's all you have to do, but it, it definitely helps if you say that. Um, uh, they said that uh, I, I personally, I don't think the, PSC should be a politicized position anyway, because, you know, liberals are not going to want to be seeing, you know, huge rate increases that are going to be affecting poor and middle class people, you know, just like conservatives shouldn't be wanting to see that. Um, you know, I, I just don't see that as, as a politicized issue. But, you know, like I said, they make it every time and it works. Um, but, you know, I digress. I could talk on that all night. Um, so this next time. Coming up, uh, provided, you know, hopefully, you know, everything, Governor Ivy makes it okay. We should have some very interesting races. I mean, there's going to be a lot of things open. How do you, how do you see these things lining up? I mean, you think it's going to be an Ainsworth, Marshall, Franklin, Kavanaugh, uh, John Merrill primary for governor? I, I honestly don't know. Um, there's so much potential. I mean, we're still, what, three years out from the actual election, uh, our election year. So we're probably about two years out from major campaign kickoffs. Uh, so there's still plenty of time for a lot of politics, a lot of game changing uh, to happen between now and then. Um, I do think Will Ainsworth will, will 100% be in the race. And he'll have a lot of name ID, a lot of momentum out the gate. Um, so there's there's that. But I also wouldn't be surprised if we saw a couple old faces who maybe ran against AIV in 2022. Um, I don't know any of this, of course. I haven't talked to any of them. But I wouldn't be surprised if one or two of those came back into the race uh, for 2026 uh, for governor. And then of course, Lieutenant governor, you're going to have a lot of folks running for that too, seeing an empty seat. If Ainsworth runs, of course, and if Ainsworth runs and there's an empty governor seat or Lieutenant governor seat, then it's wide open. And you'll see a lot of folks, maybe, maybe some people who ran for governor last time will run for Lieutenant governor instead. Uh, I think you could probably see maybe the house speaker running for Lieutenant governor. Uh, you may see some other state senators, maybe jump in the race for that. Uh, you may see some other, you know, maybe treasurer, maybe a couple others that are going to come out. And um, um, I, so I think Wes Allen, um, it's potential. I w I'm not going to rule anything out, but I wouldn't be surprised if he stays for secretary of state for another term. Um, Andrew Sorrell. Andrew Sorrell, I have no idea. Uh I mean, I talked to him more probably than any other statewide official, just because I talked to him when I was running. Um, but uh, I mean, he hasn't told me he's running for anything. I wouldn't be surprised if he's comfortable sitting in the auditor's office um, as yeah. long as he can. You know, one of the biggest things that he's complained about, and I agree with, is the fact of the auditor's office can't audit any state government or local government in the state. Yeah. And I think that's it's been moved, you know, to the state examiner's office. And when I think that puts it underneath the thumb of somebody close to the governor's office, but either way, I think it's um, a disservice to the people to not have an independent auditor who can go around and actually audit and enforce those things. Well, I think a lot of things would change if that happened. Say again. Um and up until last time, last elections, I really studied it. That's what I thought the auditor's job was, is to, you know, right. audit the government. 
Um, you know, in this speaking of that governor's race again, I think the dark horse of this thing, if he can get any kind of funding, I think Merrill will win that race. I think it's definitely potential if he does run. Um, he he generally had. I will say this: there is a black mark on his uh, yeah. on his streak, even though he really didn't do anything wrong and nothing was really bad uh, necessarily. I mean, there was some issue. Th- don't get me wrong. There's 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 issues with our election system here in Alabama. Is it the worst in the state? It's way better in Georgia. I tell you that. But you know. Oh God! <laughs> but what happened in 2020? Even if he had nothing to do with it, and Alabama was, you know, was actually ranked, I think, number one um, yes, of, yes, of the states for security. So even though there's that, he's going to have that black mark because he was Secretary of State during that period of time. And so, obviously, as a campaign, if he did decide to run, he would have a rebuttal of that, just like we said right here, that number one. In the you know in the whole country, Alabama's rated number one for election security. So he would have that quick rebuttal, of course. But you know, I would say that would probably be the biggest black mark on his career as Secretary of State that I can think of. Um, even if he didn't have anything to do with anything that happened in the election in twenty twenty or what have you. But that's a potential. Um, so he could jump into the race. Uh, I don't necessarily see that happening though, and but it could. Uh, I. I'm not going to put it. I'm not going to say that it wouldn't happen, but it's. I would. I wouldn't give it over a fifty percent chance, but it's still possible. Think he may Martha not even know now. He may not even know now. <laughs> I interviewed him the other day, and I uh, asked him. I says, um, uh, uh, he, you know, his new job is uh, John Merrill running for governor, and he laughed. He said, "Well, I'm just trying to do the job, um, you know, that I'm doing right now." And you know, typical politician answer. Um, yeah, of course. I keep, hearing, I keep hearing two different things that Marshall's going to run for lieutenant governor or he's going to run for governor. I can't see him sitting in a powerless position for eight years after being attorney general. Uh, it's possible. Um, it, so you, you have to define power. So a lot of the times, the most powerful positions aren't the elected positions. Sure. So. A Dr. lot of the Howard. most, a lot of the most powerful positions are people behind the curtain. So, just because someone doesn't run for an elected position doesn't mean they're not still affecting power and able to wield such power. So, I think it's just got to be smart about that. And I'm not saying that the attorney general is going to do anything of that nature or nefarious or anything like that. I mean, there's above board people behind the curtain who are just, you know, want to help the state get better, um, you know, and help organize things, organize campaigns uh, against things that we don't want, like um, abortion or something, you know? So um, there's, there's options out there that aren't as nefarious, but we generally see someone behind the curtain is nefarious. So I wouldn't, again, I wouldn't rule it out, um, but I still think there's a lot of stuff up in the air. You know, I mean, people ask me all the time, people ask me all the time if I'm going to run in 2026. And I'm like, I have no idea. I have no idea. I haven't made any decision. I haven't even, honestly, yeah, it crosses my mind every now and then, to be honest. But I think more of what happened in 2022 than I do about what I could do in 2026. And so like what you could have done differently. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, of course. And you know, I, I did a whole sit down discussion with some people of like what I could have done better, um, you know, and all that kind of stuff coming from a military, military perspective of the after action review, right? You, you talk yeah. about what happened, what you could have done better, what you think you did really well at, you know, that kind of stuff. So what was your question? Well, what do you think your biggest mistake was that you made in the race? Uh, not having enough volunteers. Uh, having enough I, volunteers. Yep. I think that was um, an over, I tried to do too much on my own, tried to do too much by myself mm. and not getting out there earlier to get people to help. I think that was probably uh, the biggest mistake I made. Um, besides that, I thought I did a really good campaign. Uh, I probably could have knocked more doors. I think that's another thing. 
again, gotten out there earlier, so I wasn't doing it on the dead heat of the summer. Uh, that would have been smart to do, doing it more, you know, in the cooler months. So I, I would say, though, probably volunteers would be number one is you, you got to have volunteers on your side. And there may be good volunteers, there may not be so good volunteers, whatever, but you've got to have volunteers on your side willing to go out there and talk to people. Would you have went after her more? No, no. And, and in, you know, let's say I ran in 2026 and uh, she was my opponent in 2026, I wouldn't go after her more either. I think I did exactly what I said I was going to do, which was I was going to call her out on a record. And even though I was accused of attacking her personally when I did that, um, not by her, but by her followers, um, I, I, I always strive to be the, the above board person. I never wanted to attack her character, her integrity, um, you know, anything like that, because that, I didn't want people to do that to me, you know, treat others like you want to be treated. Right. So I, I avoided attacking anything personally. I only attacked a voting record and I would have done the same thing. I don't think I would have gone after her anymore. I mean, the one the thing that stuck out for me that I did one thing on is the tax that she voted for. I don't know what they called it was for the, the cosmetologist that does the eyebrow thing yeah, and they yeah. pay like $65 a year um, licensing fee for that. I was like, I mean, that, that, I, that, I couldn't believe that one. Um, <laughs> I, I, I mean, 60, I don't know how much it costs to have your eyebrows, you know, a notch. It, put depends, in on, it depends on what you're doing, but. Um, so uh, there's another wild card in this thing. Do you think a twinkle will try for lieutenant governor again, or she's going to go for the whole ball of wax? Again, I wouldn't put it past her to do it. Uh, at the same time, it may be a little bit too early to tell. I, I think she, if she went for it, I think she'd probably go for lieutenant governor again. I don't think she'd go for governor she's still, again. She's still young enough that she could but run. She could do it later, right. Yeah, and so too. I think... If I was to advise her, um, if I said, if she was like, hey, I want to run for a statewide office that's not PSC president, I would say, okay, well, I would go for lieutenant governor. You got name ID, you have the, the, the reach already, you've got some war chest built up financially, go for lieutenant governor. It's going to be an easier race than going for governor. You know, everyone out will come out of the woodwork to run for governor when, her, when Ivy's not the, you know, main opposition when it's an open seat. So, um, you know, we thought we saw a lot this last time, there's probably going to be more this coming time. So if I were, if I were to advise her on what, which to run for, it would probably be Lieutenant Governor. You know, um, I don't know who her media person was, but the people who ran Ivy's campaign commercials, those were some of the best commercials I've ever seen. The way they portrayed her as Aunt B. I actually, I, mean, I actually, I do know the company that did her stuff. Um, <laughs> I will obviously uh, talk about it here, but um, but yeah, they're they're really good at what they do. They're really good they, at what they do. Did they do her in eight, 2018 too? Because that commercial where she said, that, I, I, steadied, "I straightened up that mess. I steadied the ship." I mean, that was a pretty powerful message. Yeah, uh, I don't, I don't yeah. recall who did if they did it in 2018 or not. I don't. I, I didn't really follow that race as closely. Okay, because they made. I mean, because um, I, I just I remember that commercial sticking out. But the commercials they made for her, I mean, was just. Uh, I, I, I mean, they made the other ones out of the waters, I and mean, I thought it was just fantastic the way they um, portrayed her. Um, so um, let's talk um, um, uh, one other topic here. I seen some of your posts on Facebook. Um, what do you think about um, former President Trump? I mean, is he going to? Are we going to have an indicted GOP nominee running for well, president? It, so I think several thoughts on this. First thought is that he's already been indicted um, twice, so he's already indicted one way or the other. Um, I actually just got word, and when I get off this phone call, I've got to go to work um, because he just got indicted again in D.C. So um, they're doing everything they can to make sure he will not be president. 
but in my personal opinion, they're doing everything they can to make sure he's the nominee. And, yeah. and they know that when they do these indictments, that it stirs up the base more in support of him, which I think, it, if not all, most of these indictments are absolutely ridiculous and are weaponizations of the Department of Justice. That is going to be my next question I was going to ask you. Do you, because I wrote a piece on that the other day that they have weaponized the entire judicial system against They have, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. Now, I personally believe that he can't win the general. And it's not because the conservatives won't show up. It's the fact that he'll motivate the left to show up. And we saw that, whether you think 2020 was completely rigged or not rigged or partially rigged, or we can all agree that the whole mailing ballot stuff really screwed up the election. And we saw in Pennsylvania, they violated the state constitution. They, I mean, they, there was stuff out there that absolutely would have changed some of these states. Would it change the full election? I don't know. Um, I, I'm not an expert on it, so I'm not going to speak on that. Me, uh, that I'm friends with, and he's by far, I mean, he's not a Trump supporter. He's, he's, he's not a Democrat or Republican, but he, he, he's a constitutional lawyer. And he said the first day they tried to change the laws, he said the Team Trump should have been in court filing injunctions. Yes, 100%. But oh. they waited. They wait until after the election. And I, I, yes, I don't know why they did that. I would have been, yeah, exactly what you said. I'd have been in court, injunction, like a, a complaint filed so the injunction could be filed, you know, find a favorable judge in the right district and get that stopped because you're absolutely right. I, I don't know why they didn't do that. Um, but again, I don't, I'm also not at that level of politics. So it's hard for me to speak to it. Um, but I don't think he has the capability of winning the general because not because the right won't show up, but because the left will show up. The left and a lot of independents hate Donald J. Trump, mostly because the media has lied. I think oh, we don't media, agree on that. The, 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 you know, what the, the media did to him and those the four years he was in office was just, I, I mean, like he said, those, they was vultures. I mean, they they lied about that man. I mean, up, down, left, and right. Yeah. I mean, the, whole, the whole COVID thing, he did exactly what they told him to do. I mean, and, and they still blamed him for, you know, everything that happened. Um, uh, and, uh, it, 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 was, it was a travesty. Um, but, um, you know, so you heard you said you're going to work, so I'm not going to keep you. What are you? Are you still in media now? I remember. I am. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, you know, I've missed you a few times. I uh, gave you thanks because uh, you gave me a lot of great advice on what to do and, um, uh, when I first started getting into this. And I have to thank you because when I first uh, really wanted to do this, I could not get anybody to talk to me. Nobody. And you were the first guy who talked to me. And, uh, <laughs> Hopefully not the last. <laughs> no, not the last. Actually, um, today... Believe it or not, I put in the um, email and back and forth and all the uh, paper. Well, I guess paperwork e filings I had to do for an interview with Robert Kennedy Jr. Nice. Hopefully, you get it. Yeah, hopefully, I get that too. So um, I've got that. Um, uh, I suppose I have Doug Jones up. A uh, couple, I think Jim Folsom Jr. Um, so I've got a lot of them lined up. Um, and uh, I really appreciate the advice you gave me and being the first one to talk to me. And um, I've enjoyed the conversation. And um, I guess um, it's probably the only, uh, only questions um, I have. Oh, yeah, I do have one have question for you. Uh, you was in law enforcement. Um, I've got a, a nine millimeter and I bought a 40 cal the other day. And I was just kind of looking at the rounds on it. And they don't really look that much different. Is, is, do you feel one's a, a better... Uh, uh, weapon than the uh, I, I mean, I personally carry nine millimeter, and uh, the reason why I do is because I can put more rounds in the magazine. <laughs> um, so the forty caliber is larger, um, not a ton larger, but it is larger, and it has more powder in it, so it's a little bit more of a powerful round. Um, but I think a nine millimeter can just be just as effective as a forty caliber. But I'm also not going to sit here and die on that hill and say. You know, never you own a 40 caliber. No, if you want a 40 cal, get a 40 cal. Um, just whatever you get, practice a lot with it so that you're very proficient with it. 
Well, see, I'm like you. I needed that 40 cal like I needed a hole in the head. I just like <laughs> <laughs> I wanted it. Yeah. 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 Trust me, it's a struggle. Every month I'm looking at guns going, no, I can't buy that. I don't need it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I walk in, I'd be like, I've already got one like that. And I said, what am I going to, you know, I don't need another, you know, it's the last thing I need, you know. But um, uh, anyway, Micah, thanks for talking to me, man. And I'm, I'm going to let you get to go to work. And um, I enjoyed the conversation. And uh, if you get ready in 2026, uh, let me know. And I help you any way I can. <laughs> All right. Will do, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye.